Uh, so on, on Tuesday, I started this series of talks um, by discussing three problems, or mentioning three problems. Uh, primality testing, which was a big breakthrough when it was first given, a randomized algorithm was first given, and on an, uh, an even, maybe, or equally big breakthrough when a deterministic polynomial time algorithm was found. Um, polynomial identity testing, which had it, uh, almost an equally classical algorithm, and for which we still are working on de-randomizing it. And um, the circuit uh, approximation, probability approximation problem. Um, so the last one we, we, we were like talking about for the, the other three lectures. So maybe let's like, talk about the polynomial identity testing problem. So the polynomial identity testing problem is you're given a, a circuit that's arithmetic rather than Boolean, meaning the gates are either inputs, say some fixed constants like 0, 1, or minus, and minus 1, and then uh, e is either sum or multiply uh, previously computed gates. And you can allow division, but it creates complication because you might be dividing by 0, so we're just going to ignore that possibility. Okay. So, um, and this makes sense over any kind of field, maybe even over a ring, uh, if we don't allow division. Um, so, uh, we'll be, in particular, we'll be looking at it, the version over the integers or over some fixed finite field, finite field of characteristic P. Okay. So, um, so the, the, um, the problem is, um, given um, uh, this kind of circuit in time, you know, and the whole the whole circuit um, is the input. So you're given, uh, you know, you think of measuring size, the time of algorithms in terms of that uh, total number of gates in the circuit. Um, you want to test whether the polynomial computed by the the circuit is the identical identically zero polynomial. One, a couple of subtleties I want to mention, just to get them out of the way, is uh, over the integers, this is exactly what you think it is, but over finite, fixed finite fields, it might not be exactly what you think it is. Because um, a polynomial can be zero on every point in a finite field without being the zero polynomial. Think of like um, x to the p minus x mod p, by Fermat's uh, little theorem, that's always zero over the over the field, but it's not the zero polynomial; it's the polynomial x to the p minus x. Okay, and um, so you can't really tell that it's not the zero polynomial if you just look inside the field. But if you go to an extension field, then it becomes non-zero. Okay, so um, okay, so. When, um, when, and in particular, that means when you, when you're trying to test the degree d polynomial, you need to go work over in a, a field that's bigger than d, um, so th that has at least d plus one elements s to make it to make it visible that the polynomial is not zero. And if you have more than d elements then you're definitely guaranteed the polynomial has at most d roots, so you'll see some elements on, wh on which it's not zero. Okay. So, um, so this question of um, whether the polynomial is identically zero is in co-RP, has an algorithm with one-sided error where the, um, the errors are only when um, the identity is um, invalid and you think it's valid. Okay, so it's one-sided, so that puts the problem in co-RP. Um, and uh, this, this algorithm, uh, due to uh, Schwartz, Zippel, DeMillo, and Lipton, um, actually, I'm not even sure whether they have the, the, any one of those papers has sort of the full algorithm. Because it, it kind of has, if you're testing over the integers, it really has two parts. One is you pick random inputs from a given range. You have to pick it big enough compared to the size of the circuit. Um, okay. but, and then what they all show 
is that with high probability, um, your the the polynomial evaluated by the circuit. Remember, we have to work over an extension field if we don't have enough points. So we have to like pick a number of points that's much bigger than the maximum possible degree of the circuit of the function computed by the circuit. Um, and um, and with high probability, the polynomial at that point is going to be non-zero. Okay, and that lemma is in, I think, some version of that lemma is in all the papers. But uh, to actually translate this to a probabilistic algorithm, when you're, that's fine when you're working mod p, as long as you have some way of creating the extension field. You have to talk about that, but there are polynomial time algorithms to create sufficiently large extension fields. Um, uh, but if you're working over the integers, there's one additional complication. Um, and that's, um, that's um, that when you start multiplying numbers and, you know, that circuit can, like, keep on squaring them, raise them to high powers, square them some more, so the, the numerical precision might get huge. Okay, so those numbers might grow are exponentially long. Um, and uh, that's kind of unavoidable. You can write down circuits where that happens. They're even very simple ones. Um, but the idea then is that you don't actually need to work completely over the integers. Uh, the numbers are large, but not more than exponentially large. So if you pick, again, a random prime, and you work mod that random prime, if it's non-zero, with high probability, it'll be non-zero mod that random prime. So the, the, so the over the integers, the two steps are to pick random inputs and then pick a random prime uh, that's large compared to, to other parameters and work mod that prime. Some, probably like most of you have seen versions of this before. Um, so, um, so that's a, so that actually like puts this problem, you know, a lot of the other problems we're talking, we were talking about like circuit approximation problem is in promise BPP because not every instance, you know, of the problem, you have a probabilistic algorithm, but you don't have necessarily like a clear distinction between the accepts and the rejects. When you're doing an approximation, you have like a range of possibilities that are acceptable. And it's not like a clear-cut Boolean problem. This is a clear-cut Boolean problem where there's a clear-cut Boolean probabilistic algorithm that solves the problem. So this problem is really in co-RP, not in any kind of fudge the lines version of uh, a complexity, a probabilistic complexity class. And it's a fairly concrete problem, okay? although it is a kind, you know, so it's a particular problem in co-RP. It's not known to be, say, co-RP complete. In fact, there aren't any known co-RP complete problems. Um, so, um, so there's no real reason, nothing that really makes this special, except that it's in a form of... Um, if you think about it, it meets this fo format of meta-algorithmic problem or circuit analysis problem because what we're given as input is, a, is an algebraic circuit. And so the intuition is that somehow uh, solving this problem might require understanding algebraic circuits, it might be connected to understanding algebraic circuits. And so that's what Valentin and I try, set out, oh, actually, that's what we sort of proved incidentally. <laughs> um, I guess, no, you know, you, okay, Valentin actually had the plan. <laughs> and I was sitting there. <laughs> okay. So, um... So, uh, so can we actually like connect this problem to um, proving lower bounds for circuits? Um, say, actually, it isn't quite this. Pro 
of this problem that uh, uh, where the so if you want to actually like say this part of the problem is just about numbers. It's this part of the problem that involves circuit analysis. So I'm going to like give a restriction of the problem so that we can only talk about this part of the algorithm and de-randomizing this part of the algorithm and not have to worry about this part of the algorithm. Okay. And um, so I'm not actually going to tell you exactly what this is, but we're going to like restrict the class of functions that we're talking about de of t polynomial identity testing to be ones where you, this issue, a couple of, of kind of degenerate issues don't um, arise. First, we're going to make, by doing this restriction, we're going to guarantee that the degrees are relatively small. And the second, um, the second condition is, is, is also going to guarantee that the numbers don't grow hugely. Okay. Um, but still, it's going to contain a whole, a wide variety of, um, of problems. Okay. So, um, okay. So, um, so, we're going to define some notion of formal degree. Okay. And, uh, formal degree of uh, an input or a constant, this is, this is a little, this makes sense, this one doesn't. We're going to define the formal degree of a constant to be 1. Okay. Just go with it. <laughs> Should really be 0, but okay. But an input has formal degree 1, and then if we have a plus gate, the formal degree of the plus gate is the maximum of the formal degree of its input gates. And for a product gate, it's the, the sum. So those two make sense. You know, if you sum up things, the maximum possible degree is the, the maximum degree of the things you're summing. Multiply is the, the sum of the degrees. Um, now, what we're not, it could be that really there's some cancellation going on, so this formal degree is only an upper bound on the actual degree. Yes? Never mind. <laughs> that, that was your question? Yeah, I was thinking if you multiply a bunch of constants. Yeah, we're, and we're also like um, charging one for formal degree of constants because, well, we, okay, so the reason is that we want to like, avoid these huge numbers appearing. And so we won't, don't want to like generate huge constants by taking some number like two and then squaring it and squaring it and squaring it and squaring it and, um, and um, counting that as degree zero because it's all constant um, because that would introduce um, huge numbers into the picture. So that's like a technical, really kind of like a glitch, but that's just the... Yeah. Would it be equivalent to just like to find the formal magnitude of a gate, you know, and sort of like have inductive rules for that? We almost went with that, but um, so like define a formal degree and formal magnitude and do, do it a simultaneous restriction. And I think that this gives you basically the maximum of the formal magnitude and the formal or weak formal degree or something like that. Uh, so, but this this was a this was this was in uh, previous work, uh, whereas formal magnitude wasn't. Yes. So now you're talking about over z, right? Yeah, over z over so over finite fields you don't run into this problem. You run into other problems, which I, I'll try to not not talk about either. <laughs> but um, but. Um, so over, z, z, over finite fields, it really doesn't matter. Just, uh, although you still want, uh, the, the issue of constants doesn't matter. But the issue of cancellation, not taking credit for cancellation still matters. OK. So, um, so we're actually going to look at, um, rather than the general PIT problem, let's look at to avoid this issue, 
let's look at the low PIT problem, which is you're given a formula. You know, so you can compute this low polynomial, uh, this formal degree. So the low PIT problem is given a formula, and you're dealing, trying to be polynomial time in the greater of the size and the formal degree. Um, so this still has a lot of interesting applications. Um, let me mention one uh, that I think came up early. Um, and hopefully I'll get this right. Keep these complexity classes around. Just a duplicate. <laughs> we have a spare. <laughs> okay. So, um, so uh, a branching program is, uh, or switching network, is a kind of simple computational model. Hopefully, I'm getting it right. Well, you can have it, okay, one, one, one format is you have a, a, you view it as a layered directed graph with edges going from, we'll say, left to right. Okay. And then every node is labeled by a variable. And then uh, the two edges are labeled, there are two edges coming out of the node uh, labeled by true and false. This is, okay. And then uh, some of the some of the end end uh, states are labeled accepting. And, and you, know, you get the definition wrong, or no? And, and some are labeled rejecting. It's like a decision tree with collapse node. Decision tree with collapse node, yeah, or um, uh, or branching program. Well, I mean, the, yeah. It's basically a branching program. No, oh, yeah, it is a branching program. Branching program, yeah. I said it was branching program. Okay, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, um, yeah. Okay, so you can associate with a branching program. So you want to say, is there a, an accepting state? You know, is the path that it, this follows an accepting state? And you can, you can actually compute that as a, a small degree polynomial. You just sort of like associate polynomials, you know, going backwards in the layers, and then, uh, you know, um, the polynomial at this state is uh, P of S is just X times, if X is zero, cancels this one, cancels this one, so So if x is 0, then we evaluate uh, this polynomial it, recursively. If x is 1, we evaluate this polynomial recursively. And so this, this, and you can just test that this is, fits the algebraic circuit model. Okay. And so we want to like, uh, so like p of the starting node tells you, exact, gives you a polynomial to plug in which variables are true tells you whether this is going to accept or, or reject. So, um, so the, great, but that's not, you know, evaluating um, the branching program on an input is not so interesting. That's pretty easy to do. What's, what's more interesting is if we give two branching programs, we can use this to tell whether they're, the, they're computing the same function. So we make like a P of the starting state for one, P of the starting state for the other, and then test with the identity is PS equal to PT. And these are multi, or, or uh, hopefully. Given that it's read once. <laughs> you need that 
there's no variable. Yeah. yeah, no variable is queried more than once, then um, these polynomials will be equal if and only if the functions are equal. And I think there's no known deterministic way of testing this, hopefully, if I got the problem right. <laughs> uh, but using polynomial identity testing, we're able to do this. And you can see this is, these polynomials are also going to have very low formal degree. Uh, SAT is trivial for branching programs, but equivalence is is only probabilistic. What is the requirement about querying every variable? You can't query variables more than once along a path. Okay. Yeah. So you can query them in different orders along different paths. Okay, so, um, okay. So, um, What we showed is that for this circuit model of low, uh, low degree, low formal degree circuits, or you know some version of what we showed, is that for um, say over the integers, for um, for this the problem of polynomial identity testing for these low formal degree polynomials is essentially uh, or tightly connected with the problem of proving uh, a, a uh, circuit lower bound for the same class of circuits. So um, now uh, I have to say, so where, where do we get our low, where are the lower bounds that correspond to the algorithms? Remember that for um, CAPP, the best lower bounds that corresponded to CAPP algorithms, um, the algorithms were non-deterministic, and the lower bounds were in NX intersect co -NX. Okay. So we're going to get the, the same uh, um, type of thing. So I should say, um, so if Um, okay, so for like deterministic algorithms, the connections are to lower bounds within X. For non-deterministic algorithms, so even like showing a non-deterministic algorithm in the other non-deterministic direction, so actually a, non a witness that the function is um, identically zero uh, is non-trivial. Okay. It's co RP is in co NP, so uh, a co non deterministic algorithm follows directly from the, the Schwartz Ippo algorithm. Um, okay. But so what we're, we'll say, so, but to, to like, the problem is you can't actually, this model doesn't make sense for computing Boolean functions. Because you, you we're just talking about computing polynomials and the representation of the polynomial actually matters, uh, at least in the finite field case. So, um, so I can't say, like, is there an algebraic circuit to compute satisfiability? Because that doesn't really define what polynomial, you know, saying it's satisfiability on Boolean inputs doesn't actually determine which polynomial I'm talking about. Okay. So I want some, in order to like say where these lower bounds are, I need to some canonical way of mapping standard complexity classes to classes of polynomials. And um, here's the, uh, the standard way. And we're going to have like this, this um, fixed canonical way of mapping uh, problems 
in a complexity, you know, specific Boolean problems to, um, to polynomials so that things make sense. So if f is a, is a Boolean function, okay, um, then there exists a unique multilinear extension of the Boolean function. And this actually came up be before, let's call it F tilde. And F tilde takes in, and you know, if X takes in and Boolean inputs, F tilde takes in and in inputs over that are integers or over the field and computes something of the form um, Uh, some multi, you know generic multilinear formula, and it's easy to see that this this exists and that it's unique. And in, in some sense, this came up before in that it's really like the a version of the reed moller Sol, Solomon code for the function. So um, so when we're talking about the the algebraic complexity of a Boolean function, we're really talking about the algebraic complexity of its multilinear extension. This can get a little bit nasty in that um, some classes are closed under this operation and some are not, and some are sort of closed if you squint your eyes. Okay? So exponential time is closed. Um, you know, you can, given uh, the, the truth table of the function, you can create this, this algebraic representation of the function as a multilinear, and there are only exponentially many coordinates and then evaluate at any particular point. So if f is uh, in x, then so is f tilde. Um, with, uh, with something in, uh, I'm also going to be talking about like nx intersect cohenx. When we go to multilinear extensions and functions in nx intersect cohenx, they're essentially in nx intersect cohenx in that, well, nx intersect cohenx isn't you know, what a, a function being in nx intersect cohenx is not really clear because, um, because you know, it has to be, it, you know, what is a witness that you're, you're two, a witness for two. Well, we say that, um, so we'll say that that's true if the language, you know, what, what we'll say is that actually affects and sort of morally in that, in the, in the sense that if f is in nx intersect cohenx, then the graph of the function is in nx intersect cohenx. But when you take it off, now x ranges over to 1. So x is an input, is an you know, integer valued input, and this is an integer. Uh, it's also true over any finite field. Does this make sense? So saying morally, these classes are closed under um, multilinear extensions, and so we can talk about, um, about uh, algebraic functions with the algebraic complexity of, of worst case functions in these classes. So, um, with that said, um, I'll state the result. This is uh, some version of this is from Ki, um, but it was done more carefully using all the provisos that I just said. In a in a paper by Rahul and J, yeah sorry could you, J, J S J S uh, and the J is Johnson. Jensen. Um, okay, so uh, and the result is so low P I T is um, if 
there exists a, a function in, a, in X so that the multilinear extension of that function is not in algebraic, sorry, I should say, like low algebraic p slash poly, doesn't have a polynomial size representation with a, with a polynomial for, formal degree, then I should say over z, um, then low PIT is in um, uh, deterministic time g to the n to the epsilon for every epsilon. I should say, you know, either this has to be hard all the time or there's going to be like an infinitely often. And then f is what you call the f in the before? Yeah. I guess I should say f tilde, f tilde, but the thing, so I shorthand, write that as MLE is not a subset. This is like, should be not membership, and write this as the multilinear extensions of functions in E are not in, a, in this class. Okay, so that's the There's a, a circuit lower bound for, for that. Um, so E, what is E or what is, E is all exponential time, 2 to the order n. It could be, I could, it's equivalent to like go exp for this part. Okay. Uh, so maybe I should do that. Okay. So, um, so if we've got a strong enough circuit lower bound, then we've got a derandomization. And, uh, and similarly, actually, by the exact same argument, uh, if um, multilinear extensions of n exp intersect ho n exp are not all um, in, have polynomial uh, size and formal degree circuits, then the polynomial identity pre quest problem is in non-terministic time t to the n to the epsilon. Algebraic p plus slash pole. Is not, right, sorry. So if you've got a lower bound, then you've got a better than a non-trivial algorithm for the problem. Okay. And if the lower bound is in x, then it's a deterministic one. If the lower bound is for something in nx intersect ho nx, you get a non-deterministic one. Uh, and maybe more surprising, um, we have connections in the other direction. Okay. Uh, so if PIT, I'm just going to like state it, you know, they're like quantitative trade-offs. You can actually get come close to matching what what the the result this result says. But uh, if polynomial identity testing, if low PIT is in P then um, uh, and then you get the similar the matching lower bound. And actually you get the same lower bound here if um, because we're we're get, we're going to a non terministic class, you get the same lower bound if it's not if it's in NP, as, as if it's in P. Okay. So that says the only way to de-randomize polynomial identity testing is to actually prove uh, a circuit lower bound of some kind. Okay. Um, but if you can prove the circuit lower bound, the algebraic circuit lower bound, then you can, um, then you actually do get um, an improved algorithm for polynomial identity testing. Um, I sh would like to point out that uh, with Marco Carmesino, uh, Valentin, and Antonina, we just recently got uh, an extension to the finite field case. So now uh, that was left open um, in, our, in our original paper, um, but now we know that a similar connection holds over finite fields. There's one more complication that I'm not going to mention. Um, 
but but we get a similar co connection between uh, the the difficulty of the computational problem and the difficulty of proving uh, circuit lower bounds. So, um, any any questions about um, the statement of the results? I'm sorry, it took. So there was a paper that uh, said that uh, if you can anonymize then you get either an algebraic or a Boolean. Uh, yeah. So this is what I'm trying to like finesse that. So if you so if you, this is, okay, actually, it stronger than, than that. yeah, I should, I should also cite um, Aronson and um, von Melkebeek, because we're, by using their argument, you can get it down to NX, intersect O NX, and then you don't have to do the, the ugly or. Okay. Basically, this, this merge is the two into like one statement. So, so, so this, this is, yeah, and in the proof, you're going to say, like, really, the reason why um, we, you know, this is just like the least join of two things. Either the permanent has large algebraic proofs, a large algebraic circuit complexity, or a problem in, in non-deterministic X intersect Cohen X has um, large Boolean circuit complexity. But this is sort of the nice join of the two. Okay, so you can take the other in algebraic uh, yeah so saying um, that uh, sort of multilinear the algebraic circuits for multilinear extensions of nx intersect cohen x is in algebraic p slash poly that implies both that nx intersect cohen x is in p slash is in p slash poly is contained in p slash poly. The that's a strictly Boolean question, but it, and it also implies that um, the permanent function is in algebraic p slash poly. So, like previous versions, actually stated the result as something like this: that either one, either this is not true or this is not true. Now I'm trying to like make it cleaner. By going to something stronger than what we literally need, and uh, but but it's a, a somewhat cleaner statement because it's directly um, going in terms of algebraic circuits. Um, okay. So let me talk about this direction, and if I have time briefly mention how we do the other direction. Um, and and you, it's the kind of argument that, that should be familiar by now. It's really like the very similar to, um, to all the previous arguments okay, with just one, one twist. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do you know, so like the the argument for CAPP was saying, say CAP was easy, and X had polynomial size circuits, then first X collapses down to MA, and then MA collapses down to NP, and if X collapses all the way down to NP, then NE becomes really hard. And in fact, if x collapses all the way down to NP, it's also in the NP intersect co NP, so it's really the hardness goes into NX intersect co NX. So saying like, uh, if x has small circuits, non-determinism plus randomness is hard, you know, can do really amazing things, okay? Uh, if randomness doesn't help you do really amazing things, then it's just non-determinism that helps you do really amazing things. If Non-determinism can do really amazing things, then NX must be really hard. Okay, so that's sort of the same outline we'll we'll do. We'll just have to like go down to a uh, a slightly smaller class than X in order to work. Okay, and the the class that we'll go to, and I should, uh, it's in the we're gonna is between the polynomial hierarchy and X. You have to add the class sharp P of counting um, problems, problems of counting the number of solutions to, uh, uh, say, a formula. Okay. 
Um, and to so Toto's theorem says that all of the polynomial hierarchy is contained in p to the sharp p. And uh, the other thing we'll need about is that Valiant showed that the permanent function uh, is sharp p complete. Okay. So if you put those pieces together, the permanent function is hard for the entire polynomial time hierarchy. So we're going to work with the permanent function and say, well, what if the permanent function has a small algebraic circuit? What kind of conclusion can we can we make? Okay. So just like in the so let's assume the permanent is in a low algebraic p slash poly. Then I'll claim that the permanent is actually in NP with a low PIT oracle. So the only thing that's going to prevent the permanent from being in NP is if, low, is if we can't solve low PIT. And actually, when you think about it, the argument is almost completely trivial <laughs> when, you, when you work it through. So what do we know about the permanent? There's only one really interesting thing that we use about the permanent is it has a nice downward self-reduction. You know, you look at the it's a permanent of a matrix. Over X one I of the permanent of the uh, ith minor, the one ith minor. Where you you uh, you cross out the first row in the in the ith column and take the permanent of the the other matrix. For determinant, it has like a minus one to the something. Uh, for permanent, it, permanent is different from determinant just because it has no minus one no minus one signs, and that makes all the difference. Okay. So, but it still has the same kind of expansion by minors that you're used to for the determinant. Okay, and so, um, and you think of it, this, this recursion tells you how to compute the permanent, so any function that satisfies this recursion at all levels must, um, must be the permanent. Okay, so that, say that someone gives us a circuit, C, and claims that C computes the permanent, What we're going to do is test using our low PIT oracle. Okay, so if C is a is a low, uh, you know, algebraic circuit of low formal degree, then we use our low PIT oracle to test that C obeys expansion by minors, um, and that C of a of a matrix that's supposed to be one by one is uh, is X. <laughs> <laughs> to get us started, and if it does, then um, then um, then uh, then it must be the permanent function, and it must be the polynomial, and not just computing the permanent function, but it must be the permanent polynomial if all of these are are equations as polynomials. So um, so that's it, because if the permanent really has algebraic, uh, small algebraic circuits, that small algebraic circuit can be the witness, and then we verify that witness using this low PIT oracle. Okay. So if in addition, and note this is like actually, we're, we're using this as an oracle, but we're only, it's a truth table reduction, or, or even a, can be made into a many one reduction, mapping reduction. So if this is in NP, then the whole process is in NP. So if in addition, low PIT is in NP, then the permanent is in NP. And we said the permanent in NP, you know, the permanent is complete for sharp P, permanent in NP, 
collapses all of this mess down to NP. In particular, K contains sigma 3P. And so when we go all the, go all the way up here, that hard function that we know exists collapses down to an exp. Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm just curious. So, uh, in, in in testing the that the expansion is, is obeyed, uh, when you also have to test it within the mi within the miners. Um. Sorry, within the oh, we have to. So here, I mean, is shorthand for it obeys the the miners for n by n, and when you fix the first row to ones and, and the first column to ones, it obeys the miners for the you know so for the uh, so so the first thing you do is given a circuit that computes n by n permanent supposedly computes n by n permanent, you like. Can get per, get sub circuits that compute n minus one by n minus one, n minus two by n minus two, and so on. Um, by just plugging in ones at strategic places. Okay, you know, you like plug in one, all zeros, all zeros, then it just becomes the permanent of an n minus one by n minus one matrix that's sitting here. And then you do the same thing, get n minus two. So when I say it, can, it satisfies um, expansion by miners, we really have a family of circuits, one for each size, and we're using thus an equation between the circuit for size n and the circuit for size n minus one. Thanks. Um, okay. Or or we could be given, you know, the sequence of circuits because we're assuming one exists for all lengths. Okay. So, um, and actually, because per, sharp P is closed under complement, you know, uh, this also, uh, we, it's easy to just also put it in Cohen P. For the same reason. This, this doesn't quite make sense, doesn't match, but it's true anyway. So, actually, we get the collapse all the way down to NP intersect Cohen P which means that this collapse goes to n, n, n exp intersect cohen exp. And that's our standard shelf collapse argument. We get this really hard function in n exp intersect cohen exp. It's really hard in the Boolean sense, right? But if you think about it for a few seconds, an algebraic circuit for an extension of a Boolean function, when you restrict back to Boolean inputs, gives you a Boolean circuit for the original function especially if it's this kind of low formal degree and you don't have to worry about huge numbers appearing out of nowhere. Okay. So that's the whole argument. So, well, let me conclude. So what we're saying is if both of these things are true, the permanent has small algebraic circuit and PIT were in NP, then some other function that's really hard uh, both for Boolean circuits and algebraic circuits would be an NX intersect Cohen X. So either way, we get a lower bound for NX intersect Cohen X if the, if the, assuming the, the PIT is easy, is, uh, is easy. So either the permanent is hard, that's in this class, or um, some other problem becomes in this class. Either way, there's something in this class that's really hard. But, but you cannot say of a single problem in the class that. Uh... Yeah, it's not like this class doesn't have complete problems, so I can't like point to any particular problem. I think I think there's some ways of finessing that, but it's probably not worth getting into. I, well, one thing, one reason is I've seen a paper that finesses that issue, but I don't remember it. <laughs> okay, so. Um, uh, so let me uh, stop with the technical part of the talk. So what this says is that, but let me say, this says that even if we can de-randomize, okay, let me just give an a anecdote. So we actually came up with this direction before we came up with this direction, and we submitted the paper, and uh, the referee said, 
well, here you're making a really strong assumption about circuit complexity, and you're just getting a derandomization of an al of like a standard algorithm. We derandomize standard algorithms all the time. Why would you possibly think that derandomizing this algorithm is something special? <laughs> that requires this huge assumption. <laughs> and uh, and so, but fortunately, by the time we got that referee report, we had an answer. <laughs> Um, so we rewrote the paper and resubmitted it with better luck. Um, but but it's sort of the referee had a good point because we do de-randomized uh, particular algorithms all the time. This is just one particular algorithm, but because it has this meta-algorithmic circuit analysis flavor, it actually has a connection to lower a formal connection to lower bounds. So this is. Um, and, you know, I think it's a little different because this, this, you know, CAPP was a complete problem. And so you can sort of like expect it to have some kind of complexity theory component to it. Okay. PIT, um, as far as we know, is not complete for any natural class. Okay. So, um, you know, that's, that's defined in terms of machine miles, I should say. Okay. Um, so, um, so there wasn't any real reason from a complexity theory point of view, a priori, that it should be something special, especially hard to de-randomize. But this says that actually in order to de-randomize it, you, it's sort of necessary and sufficient to solve this long-standing problem of proving algebraic circuit lower bounds. Okay. So, and that segues into the, the open problem that I'd like to talk about, which is um, we said PIT isn't, clo isn't complete for any class on the, um, in the map, you know, in the, in the whole uh, zoo of complexity classes. Well, what can we do when we have a problem that's not currently uh, classified in our zoo? is put it in a cage and look at it. <laughs> so, uh, so let's like define the class of problems that are equivalent to PIT. And of course, PIT has a probabilistic algorithm, so equivalent must mean under deterministic algorithm, you know, deterministic reductions. Um, so, say what other problems, uh, if we define the class of problems deterministically equivalent to PIT, we can ask what other problems are PIT hard or complete? And uh, a good example was, uh, was done recently, um, I think like Shivangi Saraf was one of the authors. I forget the, I think there were a number of other authors uh, where they showed um, polynomial circuit factorization is equivalent to PIT under D random, under. So this is another problem where we have a factoring uh, an algebraic circuit, finding the, the polynomial, the, uh, polynomials that are factors of it is uh, an, another problem where we have uh, probabilistic algorithms but no good deterministic algorithms. They show that de-randomizing this is equivalent to de-randomizing polynomial identity testing. With I think really the, the main result is that polynomial identity testing is enough, de-randomizing polynomial identity testing is enough to de-randomize the factoring. But what other problems are are um, polynomial identity testing hard? And can we come up with problems where the randomized algorithm has a completely different nature than the, the polynomial identity testing algorithm and show that they're related, de-randomizing those are related to, um, to polynomial identity testing? Let me tell you one such problem where it has a kind of possible meta-algorithmic uh, interpretation, at least. Um, and... Uh, and I'd like to find, you know, it would be, I think it would be a really cool result if we could show that it's some version of this problem is related to D 
de-randomizing polynomial identity testing. Okay. And that's um, approximating the volume of a convex region. And so you have like some high dimensional region in space, and you're trying to like say what is how big is this region? And you like start with like one point inside this region, and you have some kind of oracle that will tell you where whether you're in the region or not. And possibly an oracle that tells you if you're outside the region, what direction the region is from from this by some linear separator. So, um, okay, and so um, I think it's like, say, um, people I know who've been working on it, like Fries, Kanan, Lovash, and then I think that those were the original people who looked at markup chain algorithms for this. Dyer. Sorry, and Dyer, okay. Is, is this like the complete list of authors, or approximately? And then um, uh, there are other people who've, who've done you know Im improvements since the, the original work. Um, so uh, it's a very studied problem and uses the the, the great method of Monte Carlo Markov chain um, t techniques to, to to solve. How is it? Um, a uh, meta algorithmic problem well how you know when you're actually translating this to uh, a concrete application you have to translate this oracle for the region into some kind of algorithm that describes the region okay and so really you can think of this problem the a meta algorithmic point of this problem is you're given some kind of algebraic circuit that describes a convex region uh, you know, test whether your point is inside the region or not, and you want to, from that algebraic circuit, uh, approximate the volume of the region. Okay. And so, so my dream was uh, that maybe we could take a circuit and define a region where sort of the, the dimensions are all the gates of the circuit. There's one dimension for every gate of the circuit, and we like to find the region where the, the gate is approximately the, the right value given the previous two gates. Okay. And then sort of and then the final thing is maybe like a, a final point is, you know, uh, given some some point, uh, the last coordinate has to be less than the output gate. Okay. So that means like if the polynomial is identically zero, then you've got very little wiggle room and the final output is only going to be very close to zero on every input. And so this this volume of this region is going to be incredibly tiny. But if you've got a non-zero element that lasts, you know, you've still got tiny dimension in all but one tiny width in all but one dimension, but that last dimension is going to be whatever the value of the output is. And so the total volume is going to be much bigger. And so my hope was that approximating the volume of that region could be related to polynomial identity testing. Um, the problem is that, in general, when you do this, the region's not even close to convex. And so there's no Monte Carlo algorithm to, 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 to actually um, uh, approximate the volume. But, the, but um, so the general point is, you know, maybe that gadget doesn't work, but maybe there's some other gadget that works for this problem, or maybe there's some other gadget that works for other kinds of approximate counting problems. Um, and so I'd like to see more, more dis and distinct problems that don't seem to have to do with algebraic circuits um, be shown equivalent to polynomial identity testing or related to polynomial identity testing in, in some way. What if the region is just a, a linear program with a polynomial number of inequalities? Is that, 
is it trivial? This, this it's not trivial, but I also don't see how you, we'd be able to give a reduction from the general polynomial testing testing problem. So, so the, the, the same algorithm is the best. The best. I think the same algorithm is the best known. But I, I could be wrong about that. I don't expect that problem to be reducible to PIT. I don't, I don't expect the version where you're explicitly given um, the faces of the region to be PIT hard. Or that, wouldn't, that, that would go against my intuition that this kind of relationship to circuit complexity has to do with the problem being some version of meta algorithmic problem. But, but that would mean that if you could do that, it would be even better, an even better result. Because <laughs> then you'd have a problem that didn't look at all like it had anything to do with circuit complexity that coded something about circuit complexity. Going in the other direction, it seems like there are no certificates one way or the other for the approximate volume, so maybe these problems are not um, reducible to PIT. Yeah. It's possible. But if you but on the other hand, if you have um, a Turing reduction to to PIT rather than a many mapping one, that also wouldn't preserve having certificates. Did Paul did you have a question or just okay.